and gentlemen, welcome to our very first masterclass of the Tradewise Gibraltar Chess Festival 2018. Now, over the years, this masterclass, this tradition of masterclasses, has become a very integral one. Uh, we get one of our top players. Um, it's it's a great opportunity for all of you, our online audience, our players here, to interact with one of our stars. And today, I am very happy to have with me, with us here. Uh, world number five, number one from France, Maxime Vachier Lagrave. Yeah, hey. Hi. Uh, welcome, Maxime. Now, Maxime, you've done this before. I've done this a couple of times, yeah. It's always nice. I mean, it's sort of a tradition also here. Of course, people also should hear from other people than me, but I'm glad to do it uh, when I'm asked to. Yeah, well, we're always happy to have you. And uh, you've got your game ready that you're going to show us. Yeah, this was a tough mission, I have to say, because uh, I've looked over my games of 2017 and uh, I wasn't able to come up with another choice, simply. So tell us a little bit about, give us a, before you go straight into all yeah, the yeah. variations, give us a bit of background and what this game was about, what were your thoughts before the round? Yeah, it was a very important game, it was part of the World Cup, so um, this was already the fourth round match, uh, which was against Sasha Grishuk. And I felt his, he was one of the favorites to win uh, the whole thing, so I felt like it was a very important match and uh, I think we showed uh, really inten an in a really intense fight all over the, uh, all over the match. And uh, this, I mean, it was the very first game we played, I think, but uh, it was definitely a, a full uh, blooded fight. Yeah, no, I mean, like in a tournament like World Cup, which is so important, um, it's also the road to the candidates. Um, what sort of preparation is involved from you guys? What is it that you work on before such a massive big event in your career? Well, before, of course, we work on, you know, getting ready, not getting surprised, even though it does happen. And, uh, but of course, once it starts, uh, there's already not much to be done because uh, we leave that to our seconds and we the, the format of the World Cup is so exhausting that, uh, you know, we actually, before before March, I think Sasha played nine days in a row yeah. and I also played like nine or twelve days in a row, so uh, we just get some rest and leave our seconds to the dirty job. So during the tournament, you guys are just sleeping while the other players are working for you? Yeah, something like something that. Something like that. <laughs> All right, let's go straight into your game now. All right, so... This was a very topical Italian and, well, I won't bore you with the subtleties because I'm also not very aware of them. But you can note that here Sasha plays a6 and then a few moves later he goes a5. Yeah, I have to stop you here and ask you this A4 idea in these lines is becoming extremely popular now. Everybody's doing it at all levels. What's What's your feeling about it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a um, committal decision because uh, especially when Black gets A5, it's also, you know, the pawn on A4 lacks uh, flexibility. But uh, the idea is, of course, to get, um, like, uh, one of White's point is if Bishop E6, you take, take. No, you need B4, which is actually the idea behind A5 to prepare for bishop E6. So black plays, for instance, bishop A7, and now you expand it on the queen side. So there are some times, I mean, no, is not the time, but there are times where B5, A takes B5, A takes B5, knight E7, and then you go G4. And, you know, you, you get an expansion uh, on the center, and this would be good for white. Of course, right now, b5 runs into take, take, bishop f2, and all takes a1. And b1 knight is hanging in the end? Yeah. Okay, let's just show it. Bishop f2. King f2. I mean, it doesn't need to hang, I think. You know, even if after bishop takes c6, black had to take on c6, probably it, it would be fine. But, of course, uh, as a knight on b1 is an aggravating fa factor. But the point is, now white goes rook a2. Yeah, and you cover the pawn on f2. Then white knight comes to either 12 one or c4, and again, you get this b5, d4 idea, especially once black starts playing on your king side, uh, the pawn getting to d4 helps restrict the bishop, and that's a very important factor. 
So anyway, uh, no a5, I mean, seemingly loses the tempo, but of course, uh, if black doesn't play a6, white is not going to play a4, so that's the uh, reasoning behind all of that. How surprised were you with this a6, a5, or...? Actually, it was probably the first time it was played, so uh, oh, wow. I was a bit surprised and I didn't react in the best ways. And actually, I got to play this line uh, also against I mean, against Sasha in the tiebreaks and also against Peter in the tiebreaks, uh, in, in the match, actually. So we uh, played it my first share of times. And did they go A5 as well? Yeah, okay. that's, that's the point. And then suddenly they, they stopped. They, they, I mean, people <laughs> against me found other ways to play. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Bishop E6, Bishop B5. Yeah, Knight A7. Um, was played uh, three times against me, and 97 was played in the tiebreak game uh, with Peter, and uh, I think game went something like this. And well, it was an interesting fight. Uh, it was probably slightly better, but anyway, that's not really the point. Uh, 97 is of course more critical because you you aim for the bishop. Um, so now, also maybe because of the surprise effect. I took on c5 in later games. I took on b5 and actually against Peter, and actually I was probably slightly better there. So anyway, I took on c5, and uh, I felt it's not a bad idea because my point was this little move b3. So after this game, uh, in your next encounter, you you took on b5 instead of taking on c5. Actually, against Sasha, if I remember well, he didn't go knight a7, but knight e7. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, I mean, definitely there was no knight a7. Knight a7 came back later in the classical game against Peter. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, it's uh, really my fair share of games. Probably the only ones in the database, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm probably the only white player uh, on this side of the line. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, b3, the point is now I want to take on d6, and after queen takes d6, I want bishop a3. So, ideally, I would be able to take on d6 to force black to take back with the pawn and then go c4, like, um, especially against knight c6, but knight c6, of course, is not a great move. But uh, Sasha played rook e8. So he wants to take it with the queen? Yeah, because now if he takes with the pawn again, c4, and now my knight will join the party via b1 to c3. And you're not afraid of giving these b4, d4 squares to black? Well, I have a bind. And c5 as well. I have a uh, dark squared bishop, so I actually uh, get some use of the d6 pawn that is weak, because now my knight gets to b5, the bishop gets to a3, and the pawn is just very weak. Right. And also the, the squares are covered. The only squares that is not covered is c5, but that's not that much of a big deal. Yeah, that's an interesting point, that you're not so worried about giving these squares because you've got the dark squared bishop. Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, if I don't have the dark squared bishop, say I have the light squared bishop and black has a dark squared bishop, then suddenly the situation is completely, completely turn different, turned yeah. around, yeah. Simply like the bishop on c5 would be a monster. Yeah, black is probably two. already much better. <laughs> don't know about much, but yeah, it's clearly better. So anyway, uh, Sasha played queen takes d6. I went bishop a3, and now um, the move I was most afraid of, and actually the best move was c5. And the point is, I mean, I can't start with queen e2, but uh, something like, um, yeah, I don't know exactly, but ah, yeah, something like b6 and black consolidates. I mean, you can take on c4 now, and the bishop is anyway restricted, so I felt like after c5, I probably have to uh, do this and exchange queens, but now you take on c4, you play b6, and uh, well, it feels like I should be slightly better because of this pawn on b6, and I have some ideas to make use of it, but also my bishop uh, is not very stupid so suddenly, so mm, I don't know exactly how I should play now, maybe knight h4, oh knight f5, yeah. but somehow knight h4, after knight h4, there's already rook g8, so black is in time. Anyway, c5 was... Yeah, but that's interesting because a lot of times when you're playing against uh, 
against the color of bishop, you try and not put your pawns on that square because you want you, you feel they'll get attacked. But here you're restricting your yeah exactly I opponent's mean, bishop. Uh, when you manage to restrict the bishop, is actually the pawn on the opponent's uh, um, bishop's color is uh, actually a pretty good setup. So it depends right. on the specifics. I mean. Uh, like um, uh, theoretically, let's say you have a bishop endgame here, uh, like uh, that squared bishop against a knight. If the bishop is restricted, it's very bad for white. If the bishop is already going on c7, then it's very good. <coughs> so if the bishop can attack the pawn, of course it's not ideal, but if he cannot, uh, then it's another story. So anyway, Sasha played queen a6, which in a way is more natural, but. Uh, I didn't really expect it, to be honest. Uh, the main point is I cannot really take on e5 because you can take on h3. And, well, knight f7 is not a move. And, well, basically there's... Uh, I was actually considering something like this. Knight to f3, rook d8, queen to c2, bishop e6. But I mean the queen is a little bit awkward, of course, here, but uh, it's only temporary, so... I thought because it's exactly because the queen is awkward and it's temporary, I have to try to, to make use of, it, of this move and play before. So... Um, now, basically, Sasha played the only, you know, logical way, because you can do something like this, but first of all after c6 has bishop b2. And anyway, if you play c6, right away to prevent b5. Uh, and b5 you should prevent, because otherwise the knight on a7 is uh, completely dead in the game. Uh, no. I mean, it doesn't really look very alive at the moment either, but... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> c6 doesn't help, but that's why uh, basically Sasha took and played b5. And here I have to admit I got uh, very, very excited at this idea because um, I can just take on e5. No, I mean this was probably the main line. Take on a4, bishop b2, knight b5, and this knight going to b5 is what I wanted to prevent. Now I have many options. I can play rook e3, I can play knight d3. Both of them, uh, I mean, in practice, probably slightly better for white, but uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, like you can play rook d8, knight c5, queen d6. I'm sure black can all this, and somehow I got very much attracted to this idea. Mm -hmm. And once I convinced myself to play it, I played it very quickly. So it starts with bishop b2. The point is now, if you take, there's rook takes a4. So black has no choice. It goes knight c6. So you didn't want to go for the knight e5 idea because you didn't want the knight to come out uh, to, to b5. b5. Yeah, because then the pawn on a4 is um, in this position. Of course, black wants a3 at some yeah. point, and so the knight on b5 play. is looking very good. And somehow I thought bishop b2 would help disrupt his pieces a little bit. So he goes knight c6, I go knight takes e5. Now he goes knight takes b4. And, well, of course, I could take on b5, and, I mean, I don't think it's anything at all, to be honest, but something like this is still playable, sort of. But black probably has c5, not prevent any knight d4, and the knight is also... N doesn't have any squares, so my bishop has no, has no activity left. So anyway, I thought I have this bishop, which is ready to, to strike. And this was my main hop going for this line. So I thought I'll just bring some more pieces to the attack. The rook left. Yeah, the rook left. And well, of course, I was a bit concerned about leaving this pawn, which is a passed pawn. But I felt I have enough pieces to, con to control the, the a3 square for now. I mean, later on, it could be a problem. Uh, anyway, to be honest, I mean it's not really justified uh, what I what I did because I'm probably just slightly worse here. But um, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I felt like you know it looks very scary for black, but 
Yeah, Fine. this pawn on g7 and this diagonal looks really strong. But I have to ask you here, uh, Maxime, when you're giving up a pawn like this at such a crucial stage, and uh, of course there's no direct line leading to, well, leading to anything uh, that that's very strong for you or winning for you. Uh, what goes on in your mind? How do you take that call? Whether it's enough or you want to do it, you want to play safe? Well, in a way I want to play it safe, but uh, I also want to pose my opponent's pr problems. So. I felt like, you know, this is the only way to set him any problems and uh, while I know that Sasha is a great defender, uh, I felt like, you know, it would take him out of his comfort zone to have to play this position to to find some tricks. Also, you know, even if he defends well, there's always hope for counterplay and uh, uh, I'm not going to lose by force basically, so that was one thing. Another thing is, uh, like, even if I get lost, or much worse for that matter, then the fact that he will start playing for a win could also lead to some blunders. So, of course, that was not uh, my main point, but my main point is, you know, uh, we're here to play chess. Of course, there's a lot at, at stake, but if I s start make it Peter out to a draw immediately, then I already don't put pressure on him. So next game will be much easier for him psychologically. So this is your game with White and you want to take any chance that you get on the board. Yeah. And uh, also Sasha is known as a player who comes under a lot of time trouble. Of course, he still plays phenomenally well there. I want to ask, do you remember what was the time situation about this time? Yeah, I think he thought for like uh, 20 or 30 extra minutes uh, around that time. So. I was like, I had like 40 minutes left when I played on G3 and he had a bit less than 20. Okay. So, of course, there's the, there's the extra 30 seconds, but the position is difficult to navigate. But here, yeah, anyway, he played the, uh, the right move. Uh, of course, he actually doesn't have a choice because, um, I mean, the, this hook is, of course, cannot go to D8 because now I think, yeah, hook takes A4 is the option and rook takes d2 will turn into queen f3 if I'm correct. Uh, might not be correct but this was, yeah, yeah, this was the point. And queen a4, queen f6. But when you have that many pieces looking for black's king and black has none protecting it, uh, it's, it's pretty much hopeless. So anyway, he goes rook d8. And, uh, well, of course, I have to go queen f3. This is the point of the rook leaf bec before going queen f3. Here he had two options. So, first one is king h7, which was the game. Uh, well, king h8 might, but king h7 was more natural because uh, uh, in a lot of lines after king h8, uh, after I take on f6, take, take, it's check. So, um, and there's knight e8, which is actually, yeah, I had calculated a Pretty nice line. I think it. I think it's sort. It was sort of flawed, but anyway. Here goes knight takes f7. Mm, so you have to go bishop f7. If I remember correctly, with d2, uh, was running into something like uh, something very bad for sure. But I. Uh, I mean, you can see that the position looks very suspicious. I think I wanted queen h5, yeah. And I'm not sure, maybe it's a draw, but uh, uh, yeah, this was one of the lines uh, I was counting on. Knight g6, now king g8 would run into queen h8 and queen f8 mate, so he has to go king f7. And uh, well, I, to be honest, I don't remember all th all the things I had in mind in that position. But, but you had a feeling that the, there would be some checkmate here. Yeah. Definitely. Anyway, I mean, rook d2, there's also uh, a move like bishop g7, of course, it's a serious option. Yeah, this looks very strong. Yeah, this actually looks very strong. And just queen to yeah, c3 no, or yeah. queen f6? I mean, it's possible. No, queen f6, bishop g4, and it's possible that right. actually during the game I might have considered that and miss queen c3. I mean, uh, that's. Yeah, this looks very strong. Very likely, actually. So. Um, but anyway, bishop f7 was my main concern, and now queen c3 is the point. Um, black, 
as to go knight g3. Now he attacks the bishop. I mean, he doesn't have to go knight b3, but uh, to be honest, queen f6, queen takes b4 seems like, you know, already I got what I wanted. I mean, I am not a pawn <coughs> and I still have an attack, so. Anyway, knight g3 was the main, my main concern. Queen takes g7. Of course, he has to go king f8, king h8, would run for instance, into rook g8. Yeah, that's beautiful. So king f8, bishop a3, he goes c5. And I think here, this was what I was counting on, I uh, go rook g3. I mean, it's strangely enough, uh, what I was counting on doesn't win at all, and I knew it, but I felt like, you know, it's already uh, asking enough questions. So knight d6, you have to go like this. Uh, something like knight c4, knight c4, and uh, no, not like this, exactly. Oh, did it go? So, no. So, knight d4 here? No, exactly. Uh, yeah, okay, f4. F4 is important because then I get g6. And rook g6. Work. Yeah. And this is a draw. But, um, yeah, anyway, I didn't really count on knight g8 because it looks... So you yeah, analyze that like entire variation up till the end side that at least there is this line. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, in a way, it's sort of the secure move because as soon as you get f6, you're fine with black. I mean, the bishop is restricted, but you don't get f6. So uh, suddenly it looks very scary. And also after king h7, I mean, of course, you have to run into all sorts of uh, scenarios. I mean, this is the main one, but here, and I was kind of pinning my hopes on this sort of shots to work, to be honest. <laughs> but the point is it doesn't. Uh, it takes on c6 because now... It's king f8. Yeah, king f8. And I don't have... Enough pieces anymore. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, the king runs via e8, d7, c8. And there's just nothing I can do. So uh, I was, of course, looking at all these sort of moves after king h7. I mean, all these sort of ideas, including rook g7. But, uh, you know, after knight f7, bishop f7, the queen on a6 protects th the knight. And uh, a move like knight dc4 is, uh, well, um, I think, yeah. I don't, well, I mean, of course, you can take on c4 and it just, uh, you know, even some s move like queen e6 already secures black's position. Maybe it was objectively what I needed to do, but uh, I went knight d c4. I have to ask you here, Maxime, that uh, very often when you're analyzing these lines, you, s you see these long variations that you, you say you're counting on, but then uh, does it happen? Does it occur often that you come back and you check and you're like, what was I thinking? This is not even working. Because a lot of times I saw that uh, when you were going through of a long variation. No, of course. I mean, you when you play a game, you try to calculate the long lines, but uh, as soon as you make it long, you increase the chances for mistake. And uh, I mean, it never happens that I don't make a mistake. Basically, this is uh, how it proceeds. So I'm looking at lines, and uh, sometimes uh, wool line is correct, but uh, I missed a stronger approach opportunity for, for him at move one, maybe even. So it's not just us doing those silly things, it's you guys as well. Yeah, us guys. Good I mean, to know. <laughs> we're trying to be accurate, but uh, it's not that easy. It's, uh, yeah. If chess was an easy game, we would have stopped it a long time ago. <laughs> so anyway, um, after knight dc4, I know that I was considering for instance, moves like rook g8. I mean, this sort of moves is a possibility he has added with this move king h7. And here I wanted knight e3 and some sort of knight f5, but um, I still have control over the a pawn, so my position is not that bad, but it's still very suspicious, I mean, uh, objectively, to be a pawn down. So, you know, I was counting on some sort of counterplay, but maybe I shouldn't have objectively, but... But now you say that in retrospect, on the board, or were you... Uh, on the board, I was... Uh, I mean, on the one hand, I was, 
you know, feeling like I was trying to make the most of my chances. I knew the risk in advance also, so I mean, I couldn't, you know, blame uh, blame a lack of knowledge that I was taking a risk. No, I knew it, but I felt it was exciting, you know, at some point you also want th the game to, to, to liven up and... Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe it did more than I needed to, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's okay. So um, no such thing as too lively for the French. <laughs> uh, sometimes there is, but uh, on rare occasions. So anyway, night D C four. Yeah, I should mention, of course, that Black cannot really take on C four because now Queen F five check. It's problem. You have to go with G8 and I think uh, there is a problem here. Yes. It's a good reason for there to be a problem. Anyway, it's not very important because uh, it's clear that black is not going for this. Uh, but of course, most of my time was uh, before going knight dc4 was to decide what to do on knight c2 and this is why I'm the knight on c4 was coming here handy because now I can take on g7, I go knight c6. And the point is, if it takes on c6, now I take, I check. And the difference is that you have this very strong knight on c4 now. Yeah. And knight e5. Uh, knight e5, king d6, or rook d1. so rook d1 first. Right. Rook d1 first. This was the point. And then after bishop d5, knight d5 works. Exactly. It's the difference being that after king d6, well, bishop d8 is you a can start. just take on d8. Yeah, this is good start. Or an f7, yeah. yeah and I threaten like a bit too many of black spaces. Anyway, he goes knight d4, which of course was the plan. Uh, I should mention rook g8 is also an option and maybe a maybe a good one, but. Yeah, this was what I ended in mind. And again, the knight on c4 comes in ng, so I completely don't care about the rook on i1, but uh, it cannot take it because now I go knight f7, rook j6, queen e7, and I threaten some sort of mate, I'm not sure which one. Knight g5, probably? Knight g5, king g8. Queen at 7 King f8. And probably, I mean. Just want to take the yeah. queen. Yeah. You probably just take the queen. Anyway, because here, right now, I certain a mate, including bishop ace at the end of this line. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, it was clear this has potential for white. And, well, it's... This has potential. <laughs> this has potential, yeah. I mean, and it was clear that uh, Sasha would be afraid going for this, and uh, probably rightly so, I mean, computers gives queen e2 as only move, I'm not sure it's correct even, but... Uh, what were you most, uh, what are going to use the most topical line after knight c6 on the board? No, yeah, knight d4 was of course the most... Uh, serious. Serious option. So, now I have to take with the knight, that's clear, because bishop d4 would d4. Uh, I mean, all my ops are on that bishop. Yeah, you don't want to give that bishop up. Yeah. So it could actually take on d4, of course, this is a serious option. And here you'll have to pardon me because I need some time, but I think e5. This is what I had in mind. Knight goes god knows where, so h7, <laughs> let's say. e6, f6. No, this is where I need it to be accurate. So I need some time to remember. Because I'm trying to remember from the lines I was calculating back then, and of course it's not an easy task, but... Um, mm, I think there was some check included. And... Was I going back somewhere? No, not like this. I don't know. I mean... Because it feels like I'm a piece done, but of course... Yeah, it looks very dangerous for black, but... As well, but... Um, mm, I mean, if as soon as it consolidates, I'm lost. So I, I know that uh, that I'm not lost, that it's a draw, but 
of course. You had seen a perpetual somewhere here as a It's not really backup. a perpetual. You you fight a piece down, but you get enough counter play because you. I think your rook joins in the game, or you get enough pawns. But um, yeah, I don't. You know, you're gonna hear me say I don't know a bit too often <laughs> during the analysis of this game because simply it's too complicated. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Rook takes d4 was, of course, uh, a critical option. Bishop takes c4 is actually as well. So here, if I... So you're a full rook down at this... Uh yeah, I'm a full rook down, but uh, all my hopes are pinned on this bishop on b2. And, yeah. Here I had another option, which was probably better. It was knight f5 check. H7, knight e7. And I get back this bishop, uh, this knight on f6. And then I go e5 and I get a solid bind. I mean, it's, uh, it's actually qu quite similar to, to what I wanted in the game, but... Mm. And he's unable to defend that knight after knight e7? Uh, well... I okay, rook d6 runs into e5. Yeah, that's a point. Uh, I think that's a point. No, rook d6 actually... Rook d6 is what I was afraid of because e5, rook e6, but... Uh, uh, could... Uh, yeah, I think this was the best for white. And it's a draw. But, uh, I mean, even that position after e5, rook e6, if you just take on f6? Um, yeah, but I felt I don't threaten anything. So, I mean, maybe I, I'm wrong, but like, okay, let's go queen f5 first. And no, ah, no, it's written queen h5. Yeah, this actually is good for white. Um, yeah, there was lots of things, but maybe uh, maybe e5 is also a good move. Anyway, I mean, it's clear that knight f5 yeah. was a better move than what I did. Um, because after e5, no, you can go knight h7, I think. So that's the difference between playing knight f5 check first and... Yeah, and no, e6, f6. And this is lost for white. This is a different version of this, but uh, not a good one. So this... Uh, I mean, I think I was considering going all out. It's a different version by a whole rook. Uh, no, you have this knight on d4, which... Is supposed to come in handy, but uh, it really doesn't help enough my case. So, um, well, it's difficult to say what was the best try, but uh, anyway, queen h5, queen h6 uh, comes down to nothing, and uh, he's got rook g8. If you try and threaten queen g7, mate, so yeah, or even the queen comes back into play. So, um, mm, yeah, knight h7 was the right move. At the same time, I have to say rook g8 is very natural because uh, then you get the control f of the g-file, which is important for two things. I mean, of course, it covers white checks on this diagonal, so with rook g6. And it also allows you to get counterplay against the pawn on g2. So sometimes uh, tempi c come in ng, and of course, like pawn takes f6, king h7, now the bishop doesn't have the influence he, he used to, which is actually why e5 is not a natural move because, I mean, it's pretty natural, but it cannot be right because the bishop uh, uh, loses power. So you're just blocking your own diagonal, the very strong yeah. uh, bishop. Yeah, and now I actually don't have any counterplay. I mean, if anyone mm, has activity, it's black. So, but after rook g8, Actually, my idea was not to take on f6, it was to play knight f5, which is why I should have done it right away, to be honest. Um, but, you know, th the process of thought, of course, is, is not exempt of even illogical mistakes, I would say. So, king h7 and no knight e7. No, the point is the knight controls g6, and this helps my case a lot. 
And now, well, uh, Black has a flurry of options, as uh, always, but uh, none do the trick. Um, like if he goes knight g8, um, yeah, I take on g8, king g8, queen g4. King goes, um, well, if king goes to h7, no queen e4 check, you cannot bring the queen to g6 because of queen a8. Yeah. So anyway, you have to go back. At s king f8 turns into bishop a3, so you have to go to h8 at some point. No, e6, f6, and queen f4. And actually, now that I think of it, there was a line where I said that it's a draw at the end. This was the line. <laughs> this was the line because now, after queen takes e6, I go rook c1, and I get to take on h6, take on c7, and my pieces join the action, and uh, I somehow make a draw. So, so yeah, 98 was a good try, but again, a scary one, and uh, Sasha chose the most practical choices, but uh, also helped me in a way that, you know, uh, my options were suddenly quite easy and my position was maybe not as bad as it should have been. At this point, what was your evaluation of your position? Did you feel that uh, uh, you had messed up somewhere? I didn't feel I messed up. I mean, I felt I tried to make the most of my position and uh, it could backfire and uh, clearly I mean, after 97, I'm not sure I make a draw, but I have a pretty good intuition that it should be okay for me already. And it's still pretty complicated. Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, you know, I mean, if I was afraid of getting worse, I would have refrained from playing this a long time ago. I mean, giving up the pawn and everything and then the rook. So so uh, during the game, that uh, difference between playing knight f5 first and playing e5 first, that was uh, not something that, that you realized afterwards? Uh, I knew there was some difference, but of course, I mean, w we had very little time left and I probably saw something uh, yeah. after knight f5 and knight e7 that bothered me, uh, which is why I played e5 and, you know, uh, as often happens in this case, you will see about two options and one of them is wrong, but yeah. not the one you think <laughs> is. And so anyway, Sasha chose the most practical continuation and that would bring the exciting part of the game to a term quite soon. So it goes with KB8. Oh wait, so all this was not the exciting part? No, <laughs> no. All these crazy checkmates that you've no, been showing I said us. No, I said it will bring the crazy part to an end. So oh, it'll bring it to an end, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, rook b8, I mean, uh, yeah, suddenly he couldn't find a way to to get, like, his... Uh, the knight on e7 actually is extremely useful. It controls also the squares on the long diagonal, which means the bishop has no access to them. And thus he needs to lose some time. And so he goes rook a b8, he attacks the bishop on b2, but now I don't care because if he goes rook b2, well, I can't even take on g8 right away, I can also go queen e4, because after rook g6, I take on g6, take queen e range into queen e7, and after king h8, you take on g8. I take on g8. And perpetual? No, not perpetual. King g8, uh, queen e8, right? I thought queen g4, but... Maybe oh, you're just trying for more? Or um, I thought I am, but no. Or what? I thought I'm trying for more, but maybe... Uh, I run? Know. Yeah. Do you win enough? That's a good question. You probably don't. I mean, it's... Yeah. I mean, I have to probably... Yeah, if I go bd3, then you bishop d3 runs into queen g8, queen f7, yeah? Yeah, or even rook e1. The computer shows rook e1, so... Yeah. Computer is right. <laughs> so anyway, um, after pawn takes f6, the point of rook b8 was to force the queen exchange, because now... If I go queen f5, the point is it goes king h8, knight g8, rook g8, and now there's a double attack on the bishop and the pawn on g2. And well, the problem is that the attack on the pawn is also an attack on the king. So um, I lose the bishop. Um, so after queen b7, I just took on b7, I don't have much choice. He took. I of course, now I take the rook, he takes my bishop. Well, I have to take the pawn, it's too strong. So I take it, 
it takes a knight because well he cannot really attack my rook then it goes to g4 and uh, suddenly I, I again have some attack against his king so he takes, I take on c4 no he, he eliminates my pawn on f6 with rook b6 I take his pawn and I'm a pawn up but uh, this is uh, an elementary draw it's even easier than with black pawn on g7 instead of f7 because uh, as you can see the king is very safe on g7 it cannot be attacked so I did something like I moved my pawns of course forward uh, uh, to be honest I was not realistically trying to win it but you know trying to, to play some, some more moves <laughs> and you know uh, bring the game to, to an end uh, later on and I felt like this would be actually a, a good way to end it with, without any pieces left so it took on h6 now because otherwise suddenly I have some sort of initiative if I can get f5 but I didn't get f5 so he asked I'm for king h5 I take on f7 he plays king g4 and it's a draw so that entire sacrifice led to a forced draw in the end with king and king <laughs> there was nothing forced <laughs> about this game this is what made it so painful during it yeah, but this That's is so exciting as well. I mean, after you've had a game like this, even though it ends uh, in a draw, it's uh, and you come back and you realize that you probably missed something. It's quite satisfying to playing su to play such games. Well, I did miss things, but I didn't miss things for myself. I mean, I was never winning in that game. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes you get overexcited about some options over the board, and of course, you always try to avoid that. But at the same time, if it leads to exciting games, you know, uh, I mean, if you never take a chance, and or then uh, especially against elite players, you you just don't win. Right. And uh, how was uh, how was the whole journey of the World Cup with this game and forward for you? Well, in this match, I actually went through after uh, after the rapid. Uh, we made two more draws in the uh, first rapid portion and then uh, I won the first uh, again in, in an Italian um, in the second rapid portion that I managed to hold the draw in, um, in a theoretically lost time game actually rook and pawn against bishop and pawn but uh, he made one inaccuracy then he was still winning but steady like and Somehow I managed to hold it together. And then I won my match against uh, Peter. My first classical game went the same way. I mean, I sacrificed a pawn. This time I knew I was better, but I messed up. So I was worse. I offered a draw. He declined. Five moves later, he's still better, but he offers <laughs> me a draw back. So <laughs> I thought, yeah, I it's don't time. have <laughs> uh, But that was the second game, because the first game, uh, I was actually in serious trouble with black. I managed to hold it by a thread but um, and then the, rapi uh, the rapid format went but I mean I made a draw first with white but then with black I managed to to win it uh, s thanks to some good preparation and some you know tricks <laughs> <laughs> I always look for tricks right, well thank you for that wonderful uh, game and are you open to taking some questions of from course. so guys uh, any questions uh, around the game or otherwise for MBL it's a good time to ask anything that you've been wanting to ask him. I think they're all pretty impressed. <laughs> no doubts, no questions about this game, huh? I don't think I can take more questions about this game. I don't. <laughs> well I mean, there's just some. It's just so wide. I mean, this yeah, so many is also, lines. I mean, deliberate choice because it's very wild and, of course, it reflects that you know we don't understand that all that's going on during a game we also have to improvise uh, sometimes right uh, well i want to ask you a question uh, maxime when you when we see uh, these elite tournaments happening and uh, you know the world top 10 players constantly playing against each other most of your tournaments are like that um, what, what's that feeling like? I mean, how do you come up with like new ideas on the board or trying to make things exciting or trying to enjoy the game when you're playing the same player again and again? It's the main difficulty, of course, and generally the first one sets the tone for the tournament. So if the first one is exciting and already people are um, starting to, to win, that means that the people in the bottom need to take more risk, 
also people who start with draws need at some point to win a game. And generally the tournament ends up being pretty exciting. People try new openings maybe. And uh, there were a few candidates tournaments like that as well. And there's also the, oppo the other side where, you know, you start with five draws or maybe four draws, one win. And, well, I think in London it was like 19 draws before there was a win. <laughs> and then, you know, it's not that the games lack interest, but at the same time you don't need to take the same risks and uh, losing can actually get bar you from winning it. So, you know, you play maybe a bit more conservatively. I mean, games are still interesting, but... And of course, sometimes there's just exhaustion because you know you play the same players, and so of yeah. course that doesn't. And also help. the level at the end is so even. I mean, the level of play and the level of strength. Uh, yeah, and I think also the drawing margin is uh, is just too much for people like us. So, and generally, in general, even here you can see that drawing margin is quite high and. You know, you need utmost accuracy to actually set your opponent's problems after problems and and to make him quirk under the pressure. That's the general trend these days. Yeah, and talking about what's happening here now in the first round, we obviously saw a lot of, um, obviously I say because it's uh, quite often for open tournaments, um, a lot of casualties, so to say, on, on a lot of our top boards. Is that something that uh, the absolute elite players in the world, like yourself, uh, consider or are worried about when you participate in open tournaments because you don't know who you're going to meet and who you're going to play against? Well, I mean, there's always some part of luck. I mean, it depends who you play against, depends how the games go. But um, actually, generally, uh, I had a much more difficult time in Gibraltar in the first editions so where my rating was not that high. <laughs> So, you know, it doesn't really matter. You, you just try to play games and, you know, of course, sometimes it happens that you don't get to play a game. You just, you know, uh, your opponent neutralize, neutralizes you and you just make a draw. And, well, of course, it's not great, but, you know, then there's another game and, uh, of course, you, you definitely have to make uses of your of your chances because otherwise the tournament can get pretty long but uh, it's definitely fun I mean uh, you don't get to play the same players and I think that's an added value when I play uh, uh, top 10 players like each top 10 players 10 times a year that's uh, I think so that just no, I think that's just too much to be honest I think uh, we would be better off uh, keeping this uh, encounters uh, some sort of, I wouldn't say magic, but like, you know, you, uh, what would be um, Federer and Nadal if they played each other once a month? I don't think it would be that great. Right, and uh, your uh, openings as well, you, you enjoy playing the night of Grunfield. Um, it's very clear that also your style of play is so dynamic and you enjoy a complicated position. This game was an example of that. Uh, so do you think your style is also suited for open tournaments because uh, you're able to take chances and risks like you do with the top players as well? Uh, well, I'm not sure because, you know, taking risk, uh, I don't take um, extraordinary risk also. I like to keep the position under control and actually this game was sort of an exception where I was happy <coughs> not to have things under control. But generally I like to to uh, to take risks that uh, I feel like I can control, and uh, I think, for instance, Hikaru has much better record in open tournaments because uh, maybe he's taking a lot more. Uh, yeah, maybe risk. I think he just doesn't care. He, <laughs> he wants to show he's a stronger player anyway. Yeah, we have a question. Question from the chat, Midas127, do you ever read opening books or do you do your preparation on all on your own? Uh, no, I do read opening books from time to time. I mean, of course, not very often, but some ideas are there and some ideas you might not want to miss. What was the last chess book that you read? Chess book? Um. Wow, it's been a while, huh? <laughs> no, actually, it hasn't been, but uh, it was not about openings. It was about um, uh, endgame studies. 
Okay, well, I have actually one more question, and it's still open to the audience. Yeah, we've got you go for. Do you think for um, an, an elite player, your, your uh, repertoire is, uh, especially with black, pretty narrow, and that perhaps have you considered sort of changing it from time to time, so sort of not to write preparation? I know you're saying, okay, they can prepare whatever, I have my own ideas, or whatever. So what he's asking is if you, if yeah. you feel that your, uh, no, I'm just repeating it for our ah, audience. Yes. That uh, do you feel that your repertoire from uh, black is probably a little narrow, and uh, you need more options uh, to widen it? It's an interesting question. Of course, on one and you want to be able to play as many things as possible. <coughs> on the other hand, it's difficult to play all of these things uh, very well. So. I mean, I've been trying, of course, to to play other things from time to time, uh, uh, especially a few a few years back. But it didn't bring results. So in general, then I just decided at some point to focus on the night off, on the Grandfeld, make it stabilized, and then now that it's stable, yeah, I can think about uh, expanding again, and uh, we'll see we'll see how that goes in the next few few months or in the next year. <laughs> Talking about the night off, that is your uh, favorite opening. Um, there were these, there was this phase I remember when there were a few games that you lost in the night off. But you don't lose hope in the opening, you keep, you keep playing and I think there were a few games that you lost in a row in the night off. Uh, what's, how, do you, how do you handle that or uh, do you not blame it on the opening? Because a lot of us feel often if we lose in a line we don't want to repeat it. Yeah, well, I mean, if I had lost because my position was immediately bad, and um, I mean, uh, Ikau or Vichy, for that matter, because I think there were those two losses, <coughs> I'd shown some sort of refutation. Of course, I would have stopped <coughs> and found something else to play, but this was not the case. And, you know, I think more or less every opening players play nowadays are sound, and we can see that with the Berlin, of course, but People also play the Marshall, people also play the Knight of, I don't think I'm the only one. People play Queen's Gambit, people play Nimzo, people play Grenfell, people play Slav, and all of the openings have their merits. And in general, again, the drawing margin is so high that every opening is normally okay for black. We have a question from Mike. I'm actually MikeKleinChess.com. Such an honor to ask you a question. Um, I want to know, this is completely hypothetical, but we, we know that Magnus and Hikaru have both worked with Kasparov. I don't think it lasted very long for either. But completely hypothetically, if you had a chance to work with him, would you, especially given your uh, dual affinity for the night order? Well, it's very hard to answer this question, but um, no, it's not very hard. Uh, it's very probable that I would take the chance because, uh, yeah, Night off wise, it could be definitely interesting. Any questions from the audience? Well, while you, yes, we've got. Um, what you were saying earlier about playing, you know, the top level players, and if you're going to beat them, you have to risk losing to, to, to a certain extent. Then you were saying about playing in open tournaments and, you know, coming up against people who aren't as high rated and you're on paper expected to win those games. Are you saying that in the, the games against players who are not as, as strong, you would take less risks? Um, or would you just play this the, the same way, you know, regardless of the strength of the opponent? So would you change your style of play depending on your opponent or, or your philosophy and your style of play remains the same whether you're playing an elite tournament with the elite players or you're playing uh, players uh, in an open event? Yeah, I think it's not the opponent that changes the way you you start a game. It's the situation on the tournament. So, like, if I desperately need a win, I'm gonna take more risk. If I desperately need a draw, well, I'm gonna try to uh, get life out of the po position. But hopefully, th I mean, uh, that uh, doesn't happen often enough to me. To need a draw in the last round, this, uh, this is the, uh, the ideal, but no, <laughs> can't always happen. And uh, well, if I, uh, my situation is, uh, you know, first round or like 
I'm middle of pack or I, I mean I need to win but to do is also fine. I just play a normal game and that, <coughs> you know, if I play uh, 2300 or 2500 or 2800, it doesn't really matter because I just want to play my best chess. So I mean, to manage it is another question, but... <laughs> <laughs> So you more play according to the tournament situation than... Uh, yeah, if I take it straight risk, yeah. it's generally going to be because I need a win. Okay, I have to get this one question in. It's, um, I think it's something that all of us think about. Now, two of the world's best tournaments happen at the same time. There's Waikanze. Of course, the format is totally different, but these are uh, probably the best tournaments in the world. There's Waikanze and there's the Open Gibraltar. Uh, players of your level, how how do you, and you're a regular here, you come here quite often, how do you choose and pick which one uh, you want to play in? Because of course both are extremely attractive in their own way. Yeah, of course, I mean, Vike, Vike and is legendary tournament. So of course, you know, you sometimes you have to make a decision. <coughs> and of course it would be great, I think, if both tournaments didn't collide. But they do, so you know. I mean, there's no magic trick to to making a decision there. Okay, well, I am done with questions. Do we have any, Peter? Any? Yeah. Um, if you had to choose a period in history where you would be a top class player somewhere in history, which period would you choose and why? I think <coughs> I would choose. The period, you know, where computers started appearing, but they were still under control. So, you know, you, you learn a lot, you, but they don't um, sort of drag you. You also have control over them. I mean, we still do, but in very limited proportions. And not only that, but, you know, we feel like, you know, there's still... Uh, I mean, they still, at this time, you know, at the start, they taught us a lot, but um, I think this was the most interesting period for chess. Like the 90s, sort of? Uh, early, early 2000s. Yeah. Early 2000s, yeah. Well, uh, so I just got a message. Some uh, fan of yours from India wants to know that uh, you did not make it to the candidates, which was heartbreaking for many of your fans, but who would you be? Uh, rooting for there and well, I would be rooting for anybody. I mean, of course, uh, I have personal affinities, but you know, <coughs> candidates is you know too important. You know, you you know, um, and well, I wouldn't be rooting for anybody about <coughs> myself, but <laughs> myself would not be there. So <laughs> anyway. Um, you know, I feel like every of the eight players will have a sh will have a shot. I mean, the <coughs> tournament is so close in strengths, and depending on who gets the head start, who gets the lucky breaks, because you need lucky breaks to win these candidates. Mm. Yeah, basically everybody is strong enough to win it but from uh, time to time. Each one of them will have a shot, but who do you think will have the best shot at uh, at the world championship? A bit in minus? Well, there it's a different question, of course. I think there are some players that would have less chances, but I uh, won't name them. And name uh, the one who you think would have the most. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, really, I'm just, you know, uh, waiting for the action to start b before <laughs> <laughs> doing any predictions. We're not getting I mean any name from uh, Well, I mean, the point is, you know, uh, I'm sorry to all the Indian fans, but when Vichy won the candidates, I think I said, and uh, at least I thought that he had almost no chance of winning it. So you know, I think you just lost that last <laughs> fan who asked you a question. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I mean, and I think I was not the only one, to be honest. So anyway, uh, it's a very different kind of event compared to the ones you usually play. People come up so well prepared. And uh, a lot of things depend on, uh, you know, the scenario of the tournament. So, yeah, it's very, really impossible to make a prediction, simply. 
an accurate one at least. <laughs> and no personal preferences, yeah. Maybe, but I keep them okay. <laughs> myself. <laughs> All right, well, do we have any more final questions? We have one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is uh, how, how, far will, how far do you think France will go in the World Cup? We're not talking about chess anymore, we're talking about football now. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we have a great team, we have great players, and uh, unfortunately, we don't make the most of it. So. You know, uh, I think we would go far, but uh, I would fancy our chances a bit more if we took more risk. We played like you do. Mm, no, not ne <laughs> not necessarily like me, but uh, <laughs> if we made mm, all the players play together, I mean, I feel like the there's something lacking uh, to get really excited considering the level of the. Pl of the individual players we have. I mean, I think we should have the best team in the world and uh, in terms of potential. And uh, I think Spain is ahead of us, Brazil is ahead of us. I mean, it's really ahead of us. And I think we should be something like level with Brazil. And we are not, so something is lacking. So uh, even if we don't get a clear answer about the candidates, as long as far as the football football World Cup is concerned, you're still supporting France despite uh, yes. a few teams ahead. Uh, yeah, I will be. But uh, by the way, don't take my predictions too seriously because uh, <laughs> if I was that good, I would probably uh, my betting would go much better <laughs> than it does. <laughs> well, you've got <laughs> a pretty strong uh, career at the casino going, so maybe your betting's not that bad. <laughs> Well, <laughs> casino is casino, <laughs> and you know you don't have to win to come back. That's that's the issue. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. I think that's all for tonight. That's all the questions we had. Great thank time you. with you, Maxime. Thank you. Beautiful game and a great conversation. Thanks for doing this masterclass. Sure, with pleasure. Thank you.